So who doesn't love a good show and tell? You probably know what this is. If you could see it a little bit closer, it is the uh, Bic four-color retractable pen. How many of you had one of these when you were in school? Okay, so you cannot have mine. All right, actually, it's my wife, so I really can't give this to you, but this Bic four-color retractable pen turns 50 this year. It's been around for 50 years, and this is one of the hottest school supplies around this year for kids going back to school. Now, the next time you see one, I want you to notice at the very top, you know it has the four colors where you can click it, but at the very top, instead of having the clicker on top, it has a little loop. And it's been speculated, what is, that, what is that loop for? And people use it these days to put it on a lanyard. They can just connect it to a lanyard and wear it around their neck. But that's not what it is, was originally for. Remember, this was 50 years ago. And so that little loop was designed so that when you would dial a number using a rotary dial telephone, oh my gosh, you remember what a rotary dial telephone was? If you don't know, you would dial the numbers and it would send up little smoke signals from the back of it to, to go out. That's how old and ancient this thing was. But that was used to dial the phone. But now we don't use rotary dial telephones. I tried it on my iPhone. It does not work, but you can use it for a lanyard. So it's, a, it's an old tool, but a brand new use. So here, as I read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, these are some ancient tools here. Get this. This was written 2,000 years ago. This was written in the first century. We now live in the 21st century. Paul wrote this in the context of the Roman Empire. We now live in the United States of America. He lived, Paul did, in a pre-Christian world. Now, we live in a post-Christian world, but I would contend that these tools that he gives us here, as ancient as they are, really have timeless application. There's always use for these things because love is scarce, the world is messy, God seems far away when really He is close at hand. How do we live in times like this? And if I could take all of Romans 12, 9 through 21, which we're walking through the next few weeks, and sum them up in two words, here's what Paul teaches. He teaches a selfless simplicity in life. A selfless simplicity, because think about this. We live in an ever-increasingly selfish world. While the rest of the world swings selfish, we are called to swing selfless. We also live in a world that is going exponential in its complexity and its chaos, but we are not called to be complex. We are called to be very, very simple. And he starts with this rule of love. Love must be sincere. I agree with what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, I'm going to stick with love because hate is just too heavy to bear. Let me encourage you this morning, if you're living with a lot of anxiety and hatred and in our polarization, polarized culture, put it down. You don't have to carry it anymore. And we're kind of walking verse by verse through this passage because I believe these tools, as ancient as they are, still have modern application. Today, we're just looking at verses 11, 12, and 13. And it says this, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. So in those three verses, if I'm counting right, there are actually eight little commands and those eight commands kind of break themselves down into two categories. If you'll notice, the first set has to do with your relationship with the Lord. The second set has to do with your relationship with others. So here's the two simple applications this morning. Focus your energies in life. Focus the best of your energies on God and focus the best of your energies on people. What do we do? We focus a lot of our energies on distraction. Have you, have you ever had this happen? Have you ever gone to pick up your iPhone? And you're like, I need to, you know, I need to check this. So you, or you, excuse me, your smartphone. You go to pick it up and you go, oh, I need to, I need to do something. And you, and you open it up and all of a sudden there's a text message. And so then you're distracted from your distraction. You know, originally you were working on something else and you're distracted. Oh, I need to check this. And then and then something else popped up. And have you ever gone to, gone to your iPhone and you've done that? And you go, what did I pick it up for? 
Has anybody else had that before? We have been distracted by our distractions. We, and we're distracted from our distractions by our distractions. Focus your best energies on God. What is He doing? And focus your best energies on other people, how we can serve. And so let's take the God element of this first. Here's what Paul says. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Years ago when we were in Israel for the first time, we had an Israeli tour guide. Some of you have gone with me to Israel. Since then, Jacob is our tour guide. Absolutely love Jacob. And he said, you Americans have this interesting habit that when somebody's talking to you and you're bored to death and they just keep rambling on, you go, oh, that's interesting when it's really not. If anybody, you're ever talking to somebody and they go, oh, that's interesting, that's code for, please, God, let this conversation stop right now, right? We, we say just the opposite. So oftentimes in Christian circles, we go, oh, I, I'm excited about this, or I'm excited about my church, I'm excited about this program. Some of that feels a little bit manufactured. We're not called upon just to, to generate excitement. We are called to use our very best energies and to give those to God. Keep your spiritual fervor, says this. Do not be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. In the text there, it actually, spiritual fervor, should be translated fervor of the Spirit. So, is Paul talking about our spirit or the Holy Spirit? Yes. One of the best ways to address the day, if I could encourage you to have a spiritual discipline, when you get up in the morning... First two prayers ought to be this. God, thank you for a new day. Thank you for the way you've blessed me. You've blessed me with this new day. Thank you. Now, as I turn to the day ahead, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you have ever felt that the world is too much for you to handle on your own, you are exactly right. You need the Holy Spirit in your life. I need the Holy Spirit in my life to strengthen us for whatever is ahead. Do not be lacking in zeal. You don't have to pretend to be excited. You just focus your energy, keeping your spirit fervent with the Holy Spirit, serving the Lord. And then Paul uses three phrases, and this is of all of Romans 12, 9 through 21, with the exception of verse 21, this is my favorite part. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Uh, a book I would recommend these days, Jim Van de Hei. He's written a book uh, about simplicity. He's written a book about how to say a whole lot in a very few words. The book is called Smart Brevity. Now, Jim Van de Hei actually runs a media company. I won't tell you what media company that is. I'm not out to promote any media platform. But he said, we are overcome by words in our culture. And he says this, brevity is courage, length is fear. If somebody wants, feels like they need to write this long treatise, they're fearful they're not getting their point across. But it takes courage to be brief, just to say exactly what you mean in a way that punches. And here Paul does that. If you want to keep your spiritual fervor, if you want to keep your zeal, here's what you need to do. Be joyful in hope. Let's talk about that one for just a moment. Life can sometimes get us down, but we have hope because we see the big picture. Friends, can I remind you, there's more to this world than just what we see right now. There's more to your life story than just the current chapter right now. The story is not over yet, and we have hope that Jesus Christ will make all things new, that Jesus Christ will make us new, that he will restore us to a relationship with God. And because of that, we can be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Patient is also the word perseverance. The only option, if you choose not to persevere, is to give up. What do you want to do? And then to be faithful in prayer. If you want to keep a fervency of spirit, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Yale University just did this study. They have isolated the only sedentary activity that will add to the length of your life. This is the only sedentary activity for people over 50 
that will actually extend your life by two years, and that is reading. If you read more than three and a half hours a week, it actually extends your life. And some of you just went, well, I'm dying early. <laughs> Don't die early. Please read. Reading is the only sedentary activity that lengthens your life. I agree. And there's only one sedentary activity that will deepen your life. Prayer. Reading may extend your life. Prayer will deepen your life and allow you to tap into forms of energy that you didn't know existed. So, give your best energy to God. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Keep on serving Him. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Now, and I hope you see where I'm going with this, give your best energy to God, then give your best energies to people. Didn't Jesus say, here's the two greatest commandments, here's the best way to live. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What I'm encouraging to stay away from is giving your best energy to issues. Don't we do that? We all have the issues that push our buttons, and we want to give our energies there. No. Give your energies to the Lord and give your energies to people. And it says this, share with God's people who are in need. Next time you pick up the book, Peter Pan, J.M. Barry, I want you to remember this. In the United States, it's public domain. That means publishers can publish it, and no royalties have to be given to the estate of J.M. Barry. But in England, if you buy a copy of Peter Pan when you're in England, you will actually be paying royalties for that. A special act of parliament in 1995 allowed J.M. Barry's estate to have the copyright, to hold the copyright in perpetuity, which is unheard of because... Before he died, J.M. Barry, in his will, said all the earnings from Peter Pan will go to the great Ormond Street Hospital that helps those who cannot afford health care for themselves. He set up in his life a means of being generous. Let's talk about generosity for just a moment. When I talk about generosity as a pastor, I say that there are five forces at play in generosity, okay? Okay. The first two, you just kind of have to go through. One is duty. The second is delight. So when you start practicing generosity, whether it's giving to a person who needs help or giving to your church, there's going to be a part of it that's just an outright duty. Okay, I know I should do this. But as you move through that duty, pretty soon you begin to discover this is actually benefiting other people around me. This is living beyond myself, and it becomes a delight. Okay. The next two characteristics of of generosity is faith and fear. When we give, we are making and we are taking a step of faith. We all live with a sense of scarcity. Will I have enough for the rest of my life? And when you give to somebody else, you are saying, ultimately, that's not up for me to determine. I'm going to make sure that God has control of that, that he will make sure I have enough. And so you take a step of faith, but also generosity is a way of addressing fear. I've heard people say, and I've, I've felt this before too, boy, if I just had a billion dollars, I would be the most generous person on the planet. Has anyone else ever felt that? By the way, if, if, you're, if you have a billion dollars, I want to talk to you about tithing today. Let's, <laughs> let's have a conversation about that. If you had all the money in the world and you could give freely, it's missing the point. Because generosity is not about an amount. Just generosity is about taking a step of faith and confronting your fear. So actually, I would say the less you have, the more important generosity is to practice. And then Generosity begets generosity. That's that fifth principle I often talk about. There's duty, delight, faith, fear. And generosity begets generosity. In other words, as we see other people practice generosity, we discover what is possible. If you want to be a generous person, hang out with generous people. I want you to hear that. If you want to become a generous person, hang out with generous people. I have one friend from my past the way he practiced generosity, I did not even know that was possible. And I learned it from my friend, Danny. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice, pursue hospitality. 
Bottom line, pretty simple what we're talking about this morning. The world is distracted by issues. The world is focused on an election. You and I should focus on something else. We should focus our primary energies on God, and we should focus our energies of the power we get from God onto other people. Peter Shankman signed a book contract. He signed this book contract knowing he had an impossible deadline. He was given by his publisher two weeks to write this book. Now, if you've ever written anything of length, imagine writing a term paper in two weeks. He was called upon to write an entire book. So he knew he needed to focus. So here's what he did. From his home in San Francisco, he got on a plane for Tokyo, Japan, business class, actually first class. And when he got on the plane, he left his phone at home. He flew from San Francisco to Tokyo. He stepped off the plane, got an espresso, at the local lounge, then he got back on the plane and flew from Tokyo to San Francisco. All the way round trip, it took him 30 hours and he wrote the entire time. And by the time he landed in San Francisco, Peter Shankman, he had written an entire book manuscript. I cannot think of anything more miserable in life than that. But he said, I needed to have all distractions eliminated. Listen, we can't live our lives in a tube. We can't live our lives in isolation. We're going to be in this messy world for a while. But we can determine what we focus upon. Could I encourage you, focus your primary energy on the Lord. And focus your energy on serving other people. This is for us what is meant by a selfless simplicity. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, this is not meant to be um, a self-help time in our church this morning. It's not what this is about. This is meant to be a reminder that we live in spiritual warfare. And right now, the enemy is having a heyday in distracting Christians from what really matters. So, Jesus, would we covenant together as your church and as your people to focus on you, to give you the best of our energies, be that every morning when we wake up? And would we give our best of our energies to other people? Would you help us to get past using other people for our own popularity and to see people as an opportunity to serve you in a very tangible way? God, who do you want us to see today and how do you want us to serve? In the midst of all the distractions, would you help us to practice a selfless simplicity that honors you every day? And may we be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. We love you. We give you our best. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a few moments and respond to the Lord together.